you have been asked by a few Oxford Downs to stand uh, for the election of uh, a professor of, of poetry. Uh, how, how that uh, uh, comes about? I think it was mostly because um, there's always been a tradition that the professor of poetry at Oxford should be a poet himself or herself, a, a person who writes poetry, who may not be very academically disposed towards it or be a great critic of poetry, but, it, but basically a practitioner. Now it so happens, of course, that uh, in general speaking, since the period of about 1955 or something, almost all of the, of the poets who have been uh, professors of poetry who were poets which means the majority of them, have also been quite distinguished critics. I mean, even I have done quite a lot of critical writing of a more journalistic sort in that I reviewed poetry for 20 years in The Observer as their main poetry reviewer. I mean, I've written lots of articles and published some, but I am not, of course, an academic critic of poetry. I am a writer of poetry, mm. and I've been writing it for over 50 years, mm. which makes me rather elderly to become a professor. But... I feel, in a way, that the whole tradition of, of the professorship going to mm. a poet yes. is a very good tradition. Mm. And at the present moment, the only other person who's been nominated for the task uh, is not a writer of poetry. He's a very, very erudite and distinguished critic of poetry, mm. Professor Christopher Ricks, but he is not a practitioner of it. And this is somewhat to break the tradition in Oxford which has always emphasised, mm. or when I say always emphasised, mm. since about the time of the Second World War, mm. has emphasised that the poetry professorship should go to a poet mm. rather than to an academic critic. Mm. And uh, do you think, I mean, so your uh, context uh, for the professor uh, professorship, because as far as I know, the previous two elected, uh, elected unopposed, uh, and this one is uh, perhaps a likely, it's a likely the same is likely to happen uh, again. If I hadn't agreed to stand, uh, it may be my standing or agreeing to stand will liberate other yeah, persons yeah. and people will come, other can candidates will come forward. And make it more kind of a democratic, uh, give a democratic touch. Mm. Well, I mean, I think it's a curious kind of job, of course, because it's not mm. in an ordinary sense an act. Mm. It's not like you, you wouldn't elect a professor in any chair normally mm. uh, amongst uh, graduates from the university. It would have to be done on, on, on a selection basis of, of, of uh, how well qualified the, the candidates were. But this is different. This is not an academic chair. This is a chair to, which stands for poetry, which tries to interest people in poetry, and which in the past, especially when assumed by Auden, and to some degree, I think, uh, by the other professors of poetry that w took the job, uh, to encourage poetry writing amongst the undergraduates. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is not an academic post in the sense that you don't mark papers, you don't, uh, mm. you don't really do seminars. You give mm. lectures and you talk and you appear, as it were, to stand up for. You would mm. personify or embody the, the art of poetry rather than... Uh, teach it in an academic sense. Do you think that it's a kind of a post, uh, as you said, uh, I mean, so it's a, a kind of a, a chair of, of the Babel, uh, I mean, so the a title of one of your collection of, of well, poetry? Well, I, would, I wouldn't think so, really, because Babel was a very disastrous circumstance where every, nobody could talk to anybody because mm -hmm. they all spoke different languages. Um, I, I think all conferences, literary conferences, tend to be rather Babel-like in that you know people get chattering mm. to each other mm. and don't always take in very much of what each is saying. I think that this is a different case. This would be a. This is, in fact, because I've I've you know heard lectures given by the by Oxford professors of poetry. Uh, it depends very much, I think, upon how you see poetry. Whether you see poetry as part of a firm academic basis in literature, mm. or whether you see it as one of the areas of of creative entertainment. Mm. Uh, for <coughs> me, mm. poetry is 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 essentially something to be read and to be written. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not interested in its in its promulgation via <coughs> critical insights. Mm. 
I, mean, I think everybody who reads poetry mm. has his or her own critical aspect of it, critical mm. take on it. Yeah. But that's not the same thing as a kind of critical orthodoxy, which is maintained yeah. by an academic establishment. Mm. And I think it's good to bring some sort of recognition that poetry is actually written by people outside mm. of universities mm. to bring that back into universities <coughs> yeah. so the university people don't think that because mm. they are the custodians of poetry mm. they are necessarily equipped to understand it better than people who are not custodians of it mm. but who simply are involved in it. Yeah. I mean you can be quite cynical about this I mean Philip Larkin the great English poet re remarked once that he thought the poet at the university, mm. he meant by that not the poet who was teaching mm. in an academic post, but the poet who was somehow involved in mm. talking to undergraduates and such, mm. was about as welcome as a cow that turned mm. up at the headquarters of United Dairies. Mm -hmm. In other words, the university's job is to bottle the milk, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the cow's job is to produce it. Mm. But on the other hand, I uh, don't remember how many uh, collections of uh, your poem uh, wearing the jacket of uh, Oxford Uni University Press. And uh, your name has been an ancient to the Oxford, uh, Oxford uh, Reference Dictionary. Yes, and well, you, you, you got a permanent home in the, uh, in the heart of uh, uh, English language. But it's, that's <coughs> true in one sense, but untrue in another, <coughs> because uh, Oxford University Press uh, although an organ of the university was run separately from the university, mm -hmm. except that the university had the final control mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. And for 28 years, between uh, 1970 and 1998, all, all my poetry was published by OUP, or well, nearly all of it. I did publish some other mm. books. With and uh, and uh, the, uh, the last uh, collected, uh, your collected works um, amounting to 800 pages. That's right. That came from OUP. But suddenly, and the also, University uh, Press decided in 1998 to stop publishing contemporary mm. poetry. And also and books. so ever since then, I've ceased to be an Oxford poet in that sense. Mm -hmm. But for 28 years, I was published by Oxford University Press, and I consider myself, therefore, to be a kind of ex officio alumnus of the university, though, of course, I never went to the university as an undergraduate, <laughs> nor have I any <coughs> degree from the university. Uh, but... I have connected with the university in this sense, that the greater part of my publishing life I was published by the university's own press. Um, so I'm not entirely... And, and also books uh, about uh, your life and about your work, also uh, published by OUP. Oh yeah, but only in Australia OUP that was, yeah. it wasn't British OUP. Mm -hmm. um, OUP you know, spread all around the world, but mm -hmm. the, the, I feel the point about, about it is that um, the people that are nominating me some of them have university positions, but they're predominantly writers of poetry rather than expounders of it. And uh, so to that extent, my candidacy represents something, a different emphasis from that of Professor Rick's. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be, be the first person to acknowledge mm. what a brilliant critic Professor Rick's is. And also I remember that during the um, period of the 1970s, 1980s, he was also a very good popular journalist. He, he wrote regular re reviews in magazines like The mm. Listener. So he's not, it's not that he lacks the common touch, mm. but that he does have, of course, a high university profile as a critic, which of course I don't have, and that my emphasis uh, in this candidacy is to try to bring the emphasis on what poetry is about back to the writers of it and the readers of it, and not the critics. I would also, at the same time, of course, always have to stress, as Auden and various other people have pointed out, that um, we owe it to scholars to get good texts. If there were not good scholars, a lot of the poets of the past would have vanished and we wouldn't be able to s secure right text from them. I mean, a good example would be, I can think of two poets particularly, Christopher Smart and the Earl of Rochester, both of whom owe their present standing mm. to the assiduous labours of scholars who managed to assemble their works from what were basically sort of disjecta membra. Mm. Uh, and so we certainly owe scholarship a tribute mm. uh, for putting the text together, getting the best text, making certain that they're available, mm -hmm. printing them properly. But there is another emphasis which is particularly interesting for undergraduates, I think, in that a practicing poet 
uh, is producing the material which the next group of scholars, the next range of scholars, is going mm. to use. Mm. Uh, in the uh, independent newspaper, they said they are going to elect a a professor of poetry in the foot footsteps of of W. H. Auden. and uh, Edward Mendelssohn in his uh, email to me, he ha uh, he had uh, he held your poetry in high esteem. And uh, and he said your poetry is very Odinesque. Uh, I'm afraid perhaps it's a bit too Odinesque. I mean, a lot of people think that it's been influenced greatly by Odin. I mean, my admiration for Odin is and tremendous. Also, and, and also one of uh, uh, the people who nominate you is a great uh, uh, Odin scholar, John like Fuller. John Fuller. Well, I mean, I think the thing is for all, the, 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 you could say that there is a kind of school of Odin, and I certainly would, would be proud and happy to belong to it. But I think, on the other hand, that one doesn't necessarily write particularly like the people one admires. Mm. I mean, um, the influence Auden, of Auden could be seen in my work, but I'm a very different person to Auden, and I don't have anything like his range and mm. his uh, quite remarkable sort of psychological insights mm. and his sheer, sheer mm. uh, um, scholarship and knowledge. Mm. Um, but, I mean, I share with him the idea of well, what poetry should be, I think. Um, I know that when he was very but, effective... But, but recently, some critics they, they, they said, uh, forget about Auden, uh, Porter uh, is the real thing. Uh, well, uh, they they suggest that you have uh, uh, already overtaken Auden in many, in many aspects. No, no, that's certainly not true. But it, it could be that I'm, I've got... Um, something of the same kind of approach to poetry as Auden. I certainly wouldn't feel myself in any way in competition with him. I mean, my, I, mean, I think my, my vision of, of my going in for this is that all my life I've tended to be non, a non-official sort of person. And, um, and I, if I get this, it'll be still non-official. But it'll be quite interesting to, to find myself if I'm there, propounding the idea that poetry is in fact written by people who also read it, but not necessarily by people who examine it and criticise it or categorise it as indeed mm. scholars do. Um, I, I quite like working in universities. A lot of people, in, especially during the 60s, I used to have a lot of friends who felt it was their job when they went to a university, if they were practical contemporary writers, to, to take the undergraduate side against the, against the staff, you know, and sort of say, and be, be hostile to academic study. Mm. I'm not at all hostile to academic study. I like working in universities, but I don't like working in universities on, form, on formal curricula. Mm. I, I prefer to do, do it I prefer to be someone who just talks to um, university students and mm. looks at their works and, and helps them if possible or makes some kind of discrimination about it. Uh, mm. In other words, to be available as somebody who could be asked and consulted. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't in that way get in, in any sense, be get in the way mm. of, of the proper mm. academic study of poetry, mm. which is which is, after all, Oxford's got a very elaborate uh, mm. English faculty yeah. to look after the, yeah. the discussion and form formal treatment of poetry. But uh, your, uh, the collection of your uh, essays, uh, Saving uh, the Wreck, published, Saving from the wreck, uh, yeah. uh, published by the Chen, yeah. including uh, that collection also included uh, your British Academy lecture. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me uh, uh, it, it has uh, demonstrated your uh, poetic and uh, in intellectual caliber, perhaps well, more, well, yes, than, more, than, more than the professor. But this is way. not um, something which could stand up against the vast array of academic papers and things which are published all around the world and in every university. I mean, I, 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 I mean if you mentioned Auden, I mean, in that sense, Auden was a very great critic so, uh, in a way that I am not. But the, the kind of criticism I wrote is my right. It's not unlike the kind of criticism Auden wrote. That is to say, it's journalistic, it's, for, it's not 
formal literary criticism. Uh, and I think, I mean, I don't think that the best critics have always been scholarly anyway. I have an enormous regard for William Empson. Now, he was, great, he was a great scholar, but he was also a highly eccentric person in terms of what he liked and didn't like. And uh, it, it, all, all I want poetry to, to, to mm. do is to be intelligent mm. and to be feeling, have feeling. And I think that the, the great fights that have been going on between the avant-garde and the arrière-garde, between mm. um, pastoral and city, mm. between, um, I don't know, between what apparently needs to be done historically now and what was done historically in the past, all of these things are all subject to, to discussion, but in the end, what we really need more of is people actually looking at, mm. at the text, reading the poems, and reading more poems, and reading for their own pleasure, and also for their own illumination. And my, my job, if I should ever find myself as Professor of Poetry at Oxford, would be to draw as strong a line of communication as I possibly could mm. to people that actually wanted to write poetry mm. or wanted to read it mm. and not just for getting further degrees and promotions mm. and PhDs mm. and the like. If you find yourself in the chair of a pro professor of a, a, a Oxford professor of poetry, do you still uh, feel that you are an outsider, uh, but as a poet, you are um, perhaps a, a, a more kind of inside insider What's nice than distinction. anybody else, and uh, your poetry ha has already uh, left a mark in, in, in the English language, if you like. It has a bit, but I mean, I, on the other hand, there are a lot of other poets who are far better known publicly than I am. I mean, a good example, there are, well, there are thousands of them, but, you know, Seamus Heaney is a no Nobel Prize and winner and, and a world he's and he was professor of poetry up there uh, I mean I, yes I am I'm a publicly known poet and not a, a necessarily a very famous one but the I, it, being outside or inside has never really worried me because in some some ways it's easy to describe me as an outsider because I was born and brought up in in fair remote remote part of Australia well not wasn't that remote but I mean it was I wasn't even in Sydney or Melbourne I was coming from Brisbane um, and I didn't come from a, from a literary family. In fact, I don't think my mother and father read anything very much at all. Um, but I wasn't in that sense an outsider. I was educated fairly well. And when I came to England, I came to England... I knew immediately everybody would see me as an Australian, but I've been here so long that I certainly don't feel any way an outsider. But then I don't see myself as an insider either, because... Uh, um, I mean, so as a poet. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, your I mean, relationship with the, the English language. This, well, yeah. that's an inside relationship. I mean, it must be. It must all writers have an inside relationship with the language? I mean, and I do think it's very important to distinguish between the insight into a language which a, a, a writer has, as distinct from a person who spends his time just criticizing the language. Of course, this is a bit confusing because an awful lot of critics are also the writers of writers of various kinds themselves. I mean, um, there is. The great thing, I think, that universities do is to keep the past alive. Uh, and I'm sure that the faculty at Oxford can do that without my help. But I think it's also important and valuable to, to recognise that the best bridge from the past to the present is in the writing of the people who respect the past but work in the present. Mm. So... Uh might be enough. You can drop that. <laughs> yeah, this is very good. Yeah, we can. Uh, have you got anything? Mm. I mean, uh, I don't think it's very much more. I, to I, say. I, uh, I, I wonder. I wonder your beautiful uh, humility <laughs> could uh, play down your importance uh, in, in the world uh, in the world of of a poetry. And for me, for instance, uh, I benefit equally uh, uh, um, from uh, uh, reading uh, uh, Auden, W. H. Auden's and knowing and judging, and also uh, your your collection of essays. Yes, I think 
I don't think I'm humble. I don't think it's a question of humility. What I think it is is a recognition of, of other people's attainments and achievements. Um, and also a recognition that, that, that there are, you know, there's a famous biblical sentence which says, yeah. in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, and that, I think, is the truth of the case. The truth of the case is that literature is a huge domain. It's a vast land of, mm. of uh, activity. I'm also very interested in other arts, particularly in music and, and also in painting and sculpture, though largely in painting. Mm. Um, in the iconography of painting and mm. how, how things look and, and what they mean in symbolism, in fact. Mm. Um, but I think it's all in, interwoven. And for me, poetry is always about, about the kind of processes of life which mm. we all go through. That is to say, I'm, neither a pu I'm not a pure poet. I don't sort of feel that the only real interest in poetry is language itself. I'm not a sort of a malame. Uh, it would be nice if I were, because there's a kind of purity about that. And I'm just not interested in poetry only for its sound. Mm. Um, but it's an enormously complex matter what constitutes a fine poet or a fine poem. And I think that, that the longer you live, the more you become uncertain in your own mind as to mm. what truly constitutes poetry. And I think one of the jobs, if I were to get this job, one of, one of the tasks, I, sh I should say, I would face if I were to become professor of poetry at Oxford would be to try to point out to people the sheer complication, the sheer width of experience involved in the art of poetry and to avoid falling into the into a historical pattern whereby you just think that some things inevitably led to other things and so on and so on. So there's a kind of huge onward march of uh, of uh, historical inevitability. I, I, I would like to stand up for all kinds of different poems and I would like to persuade undergraduates particularly, because that's what I suppose um, universities are for, to persuade undergraduates to read as widely as possible. And I want to get away from, the, from what I think is the very diminishing concept which is much encouraged, I think, sometimes by schoolmasters, sometimes by journalists, and sometimes by academics, that you can just dismiss majority of the writing in the world and just say, well, you only really need to know this person, that person. In other mm. words, setting up a kind of constricting canon mm. which says these are the only poets to care about. I would regard my job as to try to point out to people that there are a hell of a lot of poets that you ought to be interested in, or you could be interested in, and not to keep narrowing the canon and keep narrowing what ought to be said about anybody in order to produce a kind of fairly ruthless orthodoxy. Mm. Uh, once you said, uh, uh, you, when you were interviewed by a journalist, you said, my home is my imagination. I do you so. do you still hold? Well, I feel quite at home in London, as a matter of fact. But if I'm in Melbourne or Sydney, I feel quite at home. There are cities I is don't feel at home in. I've what never you said in New York. I mean, okay, is this what uh, you mean by uh, being uh, the air plant? I, I've seen myself as an air plant. I mean, I've got an Australian accent. I've got all my early experiences were in Australia, and therefore, of course, naturally. Um, so much of what I refer to it automatically springs from my early life in Australia. But then I've spent more than 50 years in England, and England is still, curiously enough, a, a kind of home of the English language. I mean, mm. the English language is, is at home all over the place, but mm. England is, is something of an ancient home of the English language. Mm. Um, mm. I have never, never worried about the sense of being rooted in one place or another, mm. roots. Mm. In that sense, I'm an air plant, yes, I don't. Uh, I, I feel, I often think, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but I often think, that, except that, of course, I'd be bewildered by being scared stiff, but if I'm on my way to the execu to execution in the, the um, guillotine or something, 
I'd still be interested in things that were going on around about me because I'd have, I'd have thought that, that, that the things that are fascinating in life um, go on being so and, you, mm. and you, you, you don't, if you're wise, restrict your concerns mm. to some particular canon. Mm. And um, there's a lot of, of bewilderment amongst modern readers mm. about what poetry is about. And I would certainly think that despite my great interest in particular poets of the past, some mm. especially poets like, I suppose, Browning and, and back to Shakespeare, I would think my one of my chief jobs up at Oxford would be to try to help people um, make up their mind what they thought about contemporary poetry. Mm. Uh, do, do you think uh, there are kind of a, a ownership of imagination? No, not really. I think... Uh, well, the language is owned by anybody who can use it well, is my view. Mm. I don't think it applies to one country or to any other country. I don't think it applies to one class or to educated people or non uneducated people. A lot depends, it seems to me, on how eloquent, mm. uh, on how satisfying to you the eloquence of language is. Mm. And uh, so nobody can own... Fortunately, we speak... Language is a tribal thing. Nobody can own it. It's owned by everybody. Mm. It doesn't have any prescriptive provenance. Mm. It's something which anyone can use, but it's behoven on us to use it as well as we possibly can. Mm. So do you think, uh, as a uh, pra uh, practitioner of poetry, do you think that you c could still be yourself... Um, uh, if you elected as a professor of uh, of poetry, uh, without falling into a trap of uh, serving other people's expectation. No, I don't, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be too much of a concern, because it's not a it's not a full time academic job. I mean, you're only there part of the time, and when you are, one of your main duties would be strictly person to person communication. You you probably talk to individual students and. And you give lectures, which would be public statements, but um, um, it might be hard work, actually. But certainly I don't think that there'd be any danger of, uh, of it squashing my own efforts. I mean, I tend to produce about the same amount of poetry each year. I tend to write about 40 original, original in the sense of individual poems each year. Only a small proportion of them are good enough, really, to print, but I mean or good enough to print in books, anyway. Um, so I don't think that would come into play. I mean, sometimes one writes much more, with much greater facility than others at the time. You can go through a bad patch when you don't feel like writing anything. Mm. Auden used to say that he felt sick if he didn't write a poem after, you know, over mm. some number of weeks. Um, I think that's true, if it's a little exaggerated. I, I, I wouldn't be frightened of suddenly finding myself forced to dry up or something because mm. I was in a slightly different mm. rarefied atmosphere. Yeah. I don't think that Oxford is such a rarefied place mm. anyway. Uh, Peter, uh, this is the uh, email uh, sent to me um, uh, from the uh, editor of this, this website called uh, Candida Clark, yeah. uh, a novel, a very young novelist. Mm. And uh, would you like to have a look at her uh, email and uh, see if you uh, any question you would like to answer? One opportunity Oxford would offer to me if I was up there in this professorship would be to point out how poetry now ranges across so many different sorts of society. Uh, of course, I am only a, even a, an, a marginal authority on English poetry and English language. When you consider there are so many people writing in English at the moment, uh, such a wide distribution and so many apparent chances for people to, to be at variance with each other, like uh, one of the curses of poetry has been, I suppose, that it's very factional. People people who like one man don't like another man, etc. And, and 
there are schools of poets, there are predominances of style. Style wars are one of the things which you find in contemporary poetry. I would like to try to introduce the art concept of, a, of, of poetry as individual pantheons. Each person makes up his or her own mind about who the poets are, are who are good. And I'd like it to range across the different styles. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be a partisan to one kind of writing as distinct from another kind of writing. Whatever my own personal preference as to what writing should be, I've always been in my relations with the public, particularly if I was doing writer-in-residence jobs, um, trying, when somebody showed me work, trying to see how that work could be best made excellent in itself and not try to convert the person who was writing that way into some way of writing which I thought would, would, would be better. In other words, the, the, any kind of tutor in poetry, or any kind of tutor in any art for that matter, is there to realise the full potential of the style and the quality and the, and the understanding of the artist and not to, to superimpose his or her own preferences of course, naturally, you, you, you hope you'll encounter work written by undergraduate poets which you're able to um, support completely because it seems good. But you, you wouldn't really want to start a crusade. You wouldn't want to say, ah, well, writing that way is bad, you must only write this way, or for that matter, use your influence in, in some kind of, of com combative way to fight corners to fight individual ways of, mm. of writing. We, all, we know all too well without going into cases that there are many embattled kind of styles in the world today which hate each other, which have no affection for each other, which see, which see that, who believe they alone possess the truth of the matter. It's almost as bad as, you know, politics and religion in that sense. There is so much bigotry, so much hostility, so much warfare. Um, and of course nobody can be free of bias but there is a lot of common ground as well and that common ground really is centred in one thing is it well done or is it not well done and I think over the years you build up an, an ability to distinguish the, what's well done from what's not well done even in styles which are not partly yours and you develop a skill at being able to judge how effective something is, even if it's being effective in a, in a department which is not a department necessarily attractive to you. And I think that quality I have developed over the years, mainly by talking to other people, and more or less to contemporary writers really, rather more than undergraduates. And I think that can be, it can be very lonely being a writer and if you have someone to talk to, you don't have to follow it. I remember for instance when I belonged to what was called the group, it was a group of young poets, we were all quite young, um, I found it quite helpful to talk to them. I don't think I've necessarily changed what I was doing when they found what I was doing difficult to follow or not attractive but it helped me to focus on how much I myself knew what I was doing by learning how other people saw it yeah. and I think that can be um, yeah. a possible thing which could be offered yeah. to undergraduates.